Andrew, why are you wearing just a suit coat and a sweat fucking t-shirt like goddamn Zuckerberg over there? Because I'm going Hollywood tonight. Yeah, you said the same thing last year, man. <laughs> well, you know what? I feel it. You're the one who says it's... Uh, what's that thing you say before every episode? Uh, fucking... You better remember it quick, dude. <laughs> Really? Well, I'm a big fan of yours, Snow, but you know, there's so much I'd like to know about you. Rolling. Keep the cameras rolling. Keep the cameras rolling. Oh, Uno, two, three, Welcome to Oscar Wieners. Yes. The only show on the internet where Hollywood's biggest night has sex while reading, reading the Baga. Take it again. I mean, it's a it's an important text. I don't want to just like sh- steamroll over the yeah, yeah, no. title. The have sex while reading the Baga Bad Gita. I don't think you got it that time. I'll be honest. It's fine. I'm a Oppie. Nice. And I'm Bobby. Nice. And with us today, we have two incredibly esteemed guests. Not only are they both Academy Award winners, but they've also appeared on this show once before. And I'll say this, um, a lot more Oscar winners out there than there are guests on this show. So take that as you will. Welcome to the show, Evelyn Preston, Anna Giacometti. We're so excited to have you here to talk a little bit about the Oscars and a little bit about a, a, a nuclear craze lad that we love so much. Thanks Welcome, for having guys. us back. This is a podcast where every week we pick a Best Picture winner at random, trying to figure out what's Best Picture worthy. And this week we're talking about the latest Best Picture winner. Wow. He finally fucking did it. He that fucking British did it. fucker finally did it. <laughs> <laughs> he's probably so happy. It's crazy. I heard he's a little pissed, actually. I also heard that. I was trying to be positive. <laughs> Why is he pissed? I didn't hear about this. No, he's yeah, not I was pissed. joking. Is he actually? No, uh, no, no. Um... He's, he's wanted in his hotel this for... room right now. Like I should have gotten it back in 2002. I mean, he probably is thinking he's probably you guys should have given it to me for like Inception or whatever. But yeah. um, he finally did it. Well, who is this man? I don't even. Let's pretend I'm just a blank slate. Who <clears throat> who is this gentleman that um, that won this esteemed award? Not Nolan. Christopher. No, uh, not him. I don't want to hear about him at all. I want to um, hear about Robert. Well. Oppenheimer is obviously about J. Robert Oppenheimer. Nice. That's his name, right? What's the J yeah. stand for? I thought it was Robert J. Oppenheimer. Or am I wrong? <laughs> this sucks. <laughs> the J is junior, but like it's a it's a pre named junior. No, it is J. Robert Oppenheimer. Oh. Um, I'm not gonna look up the J because does he deserve that? Does he deserve like our care with his name, really? <laughs> yeah, um, no. It's, it's a story of the man who invented the. <laughs> Well, sort of spearheaded the invention of the uh, atomic bomb. What is what is your relationship not only to Oppenheimer the man and the yeah. film, but Christopher Nolan the film and the man? Okay, nice. I'm afraid of any person who is able to function in modern society without the use of technology. He's really um, good is that at his it. vibe? He doesn't have yeah. a, he doesn't have a smartphone. Right off the bat. I am not a Nolan girly. I'm not a Noli. And I'm not sure if they're called. Um, but <laughs> that's good. A I know if they are not called one that, of them. they should be. Um, Interstellar, I would say, is my favorite Christopher Christopher Nolan film. I'm yeah, really not all for him. I like him actually more as a person than as a director, I would say, because he does seem quite oh. interesting. The movie I thought was fine. I thought it was a lot of work for me um, <laughs> mentally. Fair. fair enough. That might be saying more about me and my understanding of history than it has to say about the, the film itself. But it was a lot of work for me to keep up. It is true in the sense that, like, as I was watching it, I kind of wish I did my homework a little bit more. I'm like thinking back to high school or middle school, and I'm like, what did he do? And maybe the education system failed me in that sense, but. 
Uh, you're right. There is a little bit of work that has to be done in order to, I feel like, fully understand Oppenheimer. And I, and I did not I did not do that homework at all. Um, but I thought the movie was good. I thought uh, I like Christopher Nolan. Um, it wasn't really as mind-bendy as some of his other movies mm-hmm. that I like. Mm-hmm. But uh, it did it did get me thinking about, you know, I, I liked its anti-war sentiments and, and whatnot. Um, but is it the prestige? I don't know. That remains to be seen. I really liked how it felt like a kind of like a episode of SNL where they bring back all the like surprise cameos. Yeah. Like this was a star studded cast that I didn't realize how freaking star studded and people would just pop up. And that was fun for me. I saw like uh Nat Wolf from Naked Brothers Band popped up in there. Like those were the, that, those were my favorite parts of the movie. I do wish he sung Crazy Car, but his his presence was welcome for sure. Evelyn, same question to you. What are your what are your what are your initial thoughts on J. Robert Oppenheimer, the man in the film, and also Christopher Nolan, the film in the man? I had no idea who J. Robert Oppenheimer was. To be honest, I was under the impression that Albert Einstein invented the atomic bomb. So I guess the um, school system really, really failed me. Like if it failed Andrew, like it just like it just it didn't even bother with me. I think it just it left me at the bus stop. (laughs) The bus just kept going. I mean, to be fair to you, Evelyn, I I also kind of thought Einstein was behind this whole thing. (laughs) And I famously like Narciss. Einstein? Yeah. That's what makes him kind of cool, even though he like married his like third cousin or whatever. <laughs> did he? Yeah. <laughs> What's when's his movie coming? But he out? did. He invented <laughs> the relativity theory thing, so that's that kind of is good. Sort of. I was one of the did. people. I know this has become like a Twitter thing, but I really thought he was alive way earlier. I saw than this movie. Yes. I was worried you're going to say I thought he was alive today. No. <laughs> I yeah. thought he died in like 1910. He yeah he was he was swinging for a while. He probably that, like that listened to like the Beatles. Isn't that weird? That upsets he me. He listened I don't to know the why. White Album, and he hated the White Album. He listened to it and was like, "This is not it." He's like, "This is indulgent." <laughs> he said, "Where's the color?" Thirty songs, ninety minutes. Who the fuck has time for this? Um, <laughs> I, have to, I have a bomb to not build. <laughs> um, do you have a history with Christopher Nolan? Um, I really like him i like his movies i love the movie it's a lot to keep up with it's you know there's a lot of i feel like there's the only thing that i didn't really like about it was like how many cuts there were like i felt like i kept like getting cut and like it's like next scene and like he's like trying to squeeze so much into the movie and like it still feels so bloated and like yet like I'm like, feel like I'm like hanging on, like I'm on like a roller coaster because like the movie's like moving so fast. Do we know <laughs> how close That's really good. everything is to true events? And does it does it matter? No. Do we care? As far as I, I know, I don't he, care. As far as I know, he adapts the um the American Prometheus, the book that was like researched for 25 years. Um, so he kind of ganked the story, is what you're saying. Is that what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> so it sounds, it sounds like to me he grabbed the book and said, this is going to be a movie now because I say so. Robert Pattinson actually gave him the idea for a movie about Oppenheimer. Really? Are you serious? On the set of Tenet, I, I, I think as a rap gift, Robert Pattinson gave him a book of Oppenheimer speeches because Tenet sort of deals with like, what if you can prevent, an, what if you could prevent an apocalypse? I've been waiting to talk about Nolan this whole podcast. This whole podcast is a stealth way for me to talk about Nolan. That is true. That's that's kind of how our friendship was founded in a way. This is why I want to get to it a little bit. All right, go ahead. Are you a Noli? Okay. 2005, July. Oh, no. I'm eight years old. I turned nine that year, but I'm still eight. I I I got the fucking Batman Begins video game, which had I also same thing with the Revenge of the Sith video game had like actual clips from the movie cut in. This is before the movie came out too, so you're like seeing parts of the movie and it's like very exciting. So I am mem- I'm playing this game and I'm memorizing the clips because I'm like this shit slaps. I love Batman. I go to see Batman Begins with my father. Any objections to that? 
<laughs> no, it's all good. good. Um, it's fine. And I remember like these clips from the video game coming up, and I was like mouthing them to myself, and like I was like, "This guy's special. He can get in my fucking brain." The, the movie slapped me around. Then the Dark Knight. Three years later, I'm boy. We're really going quick. I'm twelve. We're, we're, it's almost like. This story has some Nolan editing. Time's flying. I'm crying, actually. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, hold on. Um, I'm 12 when fucking Dark Knight comes out. I remember one of my friends calling me, not Ander. Um, my friends <laughs> called me. I hadn't seen Dark Knight yet. He called me and was telling me the whole movie over the phone, and I was, like, losing my mind. He was telling me all the Joker scenes. I was like, this is going to revolutionize cinema. And you know what? It did. <laughs> I'm sorry, you said this at 12 years old. Yeah. <laughs> you hung up you hung up your next telephone and said I wasn't very popular. This is gonna actually. revolutionize cinema. Wait, I'm actually just hung up on the fact that this was a movie you were so excited about seeing and you let someone explain the whole plot to you before you saw it. You didn't say, Hey, hey, hey. <laughs> I've been waiting about. years for this. Yeah, I guess at that point I was just like, I gotta get any taste I can. Cause like interesting. My dad famously hates crowds. He wanted to wait till, you know, the movie was less crowded. The theater was less crowded. So we, well, we'd go see a lot of these like huge movies like three weeks after they came out when I was like literally frothing at the mouth. Um, <laughs> two years later, Inception comes out. Uh, it's and it's like the best shit I've ever seen in my life. And me and Andrew Pretty tight. kissed during it. And <laughs> yeah, we were it was 14. really good. <laughs> <laughs> we kissed about it and over it um <laughs> and yeah it's sort of like a weirdly like pivotal movie in our friendship um Andrew, um, do you feel the same way no not at all actually uh <laughs> i kind of thought the pivotal movie in our friendship was uh young uh, guns too <laughs> <laughs> uh, no yes i do feel the same way we definitely bonded over that film a lot i remember like researching the shit out of that movie He's one of my guys, and I know like he has his flaws. Obviously, he can't write a woman for shit. What's um, the name of Florence Pugh's character in the movie again? Uh, Jean. Jean. Jean Tatlock. Because I, I, I feel like I agree with what you were saying, Ander. But I felt like in Oppenheimer, I did feel like emotionally involved in like Jean's storyline mm -hmm. because of like the like suicide and stuff. I was like. I, I don't know. I felt like that was like sort of like Nolan like reaching out like emotionally to like the audience. And like I I felt like emotionally connected. Yeah, I, I agree. I think the Florence again, watching it the second time, I think the the two kind of main women in this movie, Florence Pugh's character and Emily Blunt's uh character Kitty, um, Oppenheimer's wife, um I think they are underserved, but I do think their performances are actually both really good. I think um, the way he told his uh, Oppenheimer story really kind of has you questioning if he is a good person, the whole, like every decision he makes in a way that's really interesting. I, it had me thinking a lot about like where we are with AI right now. And I think it mirrored a lot of like present day themes. I'm sure there's some, there's a, there's a, a gang of folks right now in Cupertino thinking about AI and it's kind of like the little Oppenheimer team in a sense like their own little Manhattan <laughs> project the movie is like paced like a heist movie like it's crazy um it's like we got to plan this thing and then execute it um these guys like aren't thinking about the ramifications of what they're doing it's like this will literally change the world like Oppenheimer thinks that once they do this once they drop the bomb they will understand like the totality of like how horrible it is and they'll then will stop at any say he previously had just gets revoked they're like actually um we don't like you very much and you're done and you don't get any say in what we do with our nuclear bombs this is like a movie about a bunch of nerds who want the jocks to take them seriously and they want that so bad that they like make a weapon of mass destruction and then at the end it's just like Thanks, nerd. See you later. And they just wheel away like the science project you did for them. I was just so impressed with how quickly they could build a town. Like, <laughs> yeah. That was incredible to see. That seemed like a huge feat for me. So I can't even imagine like what it would take to build an actual bomb because the fact that they built that town 
so quickly. They got everyone there. I just couldn't get over that. And when they built the town, I thought the movie was over after that. I was like, oh, shit, they did it. And it's like, they oh, no, it. there's an hour left? <laughs> Two hours so left? Oh. Several hours left. <laughs> oh, shit. I always thought, like, the town was, like, a front. So, like, no one would, Ew. like, suspect what they were doing. But, like, in the movie, they explain, like, oh, we need a town so, like, people, like, will not want to leave. And, like, yeah. still, like, feel at home here and, like, want to, like, keep working and, like, feel passionate about this because they feel connected to, like, the place that they're working. I mean, it's kind of like Google, right? If you think about it. Mm -hmm. They built the campuses and they're like, everybody just come live here and now they're working on AI. <laughs> yeah, we don't even know. Exactly. Should we Should we wrap up Oppenheimer? I'm sorry. <laughs> I think I'm done. I think I'm ready for final thoughts on him. That's fucking crazy. Oh my God. <laughs> what I want to get into, maybe let's just like talk about like, because I do feel like the, the movie has like three movements if we <laughs> have been studying symphonies. So, and you know, I, I, I got after Maestro, I got really into symphonies. Um, the first sort of movement of the movie where he's like sort of in college and is like losing his mind he's like i see atoms and i can't fucking deal with it yeah, i see the quantum realm his teacher yeah what's that about I feel well like that's that that's that's what made him over. go to go to therapy because he was like i think i might be losing it okay <laughs> honestly the first part might be my least favorite part because something that confused me about the first part was i didn't i felt like his intelligence like wasn't like being like illustrated to me enough i'm like is this guy even smart because <laughs> I, when you i feel i think it was you michael who was saying it before that he had like he spearheads like the nuclear bomb like he doesn't invent it was that you or andrew that said that before i, I forget. think i think i i think i said that i think you said that and it, that kind of like clicked something in my brain i was like yeah, he was kind of like the project manager for the nuke, but like I felt like I I just I feel like that his like his involvement in like designing it and inventing it like wasn't like being like delivered to me, right? So like and in those beginning in those beginning parts of the movie, I felt like that would have been a good time to be like he's really smart, you know? <laughs> just have him like write shit it. down on a chalkboard and be like i get it now <laughs> no th that, i did I not that mean a... to laugh but project manager for the nuke is just such a funny <laughs> synopsis of this movie there was like guys can we Zoom circle meetings. back to the plutonium of it all like next week i kind of have a early lunch to get to <laughs> guys um, cc me on your fission emails <laughs> um no that is a I do hear what you're saying because even because the movie moves so fast, like in the second part when um, Josh Hartnett, who's like the he's like the anti-union. He plays uh, Lawrence. He's like the anti-union. Like when when Oppenheimer, the other you, guys, professor. you guys know who I'm talking about? He's when Oppenheimer goes to the fucking Berkeley. I think it is. He's the guy he's like who's the like doing actual shit. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um when it gets to the point where like Hartnett is telling Oppenheimer to cool the communist shit because like if you want to be a part of making the bomb you should like shut the hell up about that stuff I'm like okay I get that but then like I don't know 10 minutes later Oppenheimer's like in charge of like recruiting everybody for the bomb I'm like how'd we get here yeah it, it is a little it's like a little jumbled where I'm like oh what well, they add a lot of characters really fast. It's almost like assembling the team for the heist, to, to continue the, the heist metaphor. Yeah. Um, and maybe it's a little bit unwieldy, but it kind of adds, I suppose, to... It's like, okay, we're building something here. We got... Uh, Josh Peck is here for some reason. We got Matt Damon. We got Remy Malik, who's not going to say anything yet. He's not going to, but he, but his, his he's fucking important. eyes are watching. <laughs> yeah, he's watching though. Don't you fucking worry. I forgot um, about Josh Peck. That feels like a fever dream. He presses he, the button at the Trinity test. I like that's that crazy. So he probably called Drake Bell and was fucking wilding out, as the kids say. Josh Peck in that role is distracting. A little bit, yeah. Like, I don't know why Nolan had to have Josh in that role. He, here's the thing. Here's the thing. 
I think the reason he has, I think he has, I think Roderick's in there because, like from Roderick Rules. I don't know what, what the hell you're oh, talking about. Oh, from Diary of Olympic Kid? Yeah. Sexy Roderick. Yeah. I think yeah. the reason he has, he has people like that and he has Nat Wolf, he has fucking, um, all kinds of fuckers. He has Benny Safty. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that was. Team of Nickelodeon. He, I think the reason he has all these people is because there's so many names and like, it's hard to remember who everybody is that like, he's like, oh, that's Josh Peck. Like, I do think there's supposed to be like a recognition with like who you're seeing because it's it, it's just like an easy shorthand. Okay. He's like but using the audience's point... familiarity to just hmm. make shit easier. Isn't that a script issue? I feel like that's a script issue you're covering with casting. Hmm. That's also Maybe. a good point. I just think there's so many people. I think he's like trying to be as accurate as possible that there's so many names and people around that he's like, I need to simplify this. But you know what? Like, if it didn't matter enough for us to remember who this person was, maybe they just shouldn't have been in the story at all. Or I feel like you could cast someone who's maybe not as distracting as Josh Peck. I was available. Miranda Cosgrove probably was. <laughs> Miranda Cosgrove. No, no, no. It's a Nolan movie. That means no women. No women. <laughs> Off no limits. No women at all. Um, but any white guy is fine. <laughs> any white guy is fine. <laughs> You should have won, Andrew. <laughs> I was going to say, probably I was like, would have gotten a role. Andrew, why did we fucking audition? Button, we could have been in there. We could have been. We could have been guys who like puts those put those crazy sunglasses on and go, "Whoa, look at that bomb!" We could have been you, in there, Andrew. You might skew a little too blonde for the movie. You think so? Why? Why? I could be blonde in an Oppenheimer film. Nolan, call me up. Hit me up for the Prestige too. I want to be the Prestige. I'll be Jackman's double. The Pertuge. <laughs> um Part of the movie that I was the most into was the grappling with his decisions. So kind of the third act. I don't think the first act at that point, I was like, okay, I know what's going to happen. Like, let's get there. Honestly, I think if they were to get down the time of the movie, like the runtime, we could have made some cuts. Yeah. Why is the movie long? <laughs> the movie's way too the movie's like three hours long. I'm let's get back to like two hours and thirty minutes max. <laughs> let's get to that bomb quick. Yeah. Um, come on. What do we think about the kind of Los Alamos and even the we've we've gotten into it a little bit, but the you know Florence Pugh Kitty stuff, Oppenheimer being a communist, or like kind of running in communist circles, not remembering his boyfriend, his boyfriend, <laughs> not remembering his brother's, not, not, not remembering his brother's girlfriend's name, not fucking just being kind that of could have been a, a man about town, and also building the bomb. What do we think about all this? That whole time, I'm just trying to figure out what Robert Downey Jr.'s job is. Not the actor, but like his character wasn't he like um secretary of the treasury or something wasn't that what he was up for or something he's trying to be but then that's they, what the hearing was for yeah they thwarted his ass yeah <laughs> they got him fucking han solo was like no way today <laughs> rami Jose. got his ass like i think it's so fun when it's like well <laughs> fun isn't the right word <laughs> but it is kind of fun it's fun you're like i think i think this movie gets away with like I don't know. The second time watching it, I was like, I want them to build this thing because they're kind of like fun friends. That goes back to what you were talking about about pacing. Like it, mo it's moving so quickly, and you're get you're seeing all of this stuff happening, like a whole town being built, people moving their lives. You kind of feel the camaraderie. It feels like a fun summer camp where you're <laughs> all just like working really hard because you're gonna win the gold medal. So. <laughs> In that sense, you do kind of get lost in it and want this thing to happen where there's that scene where they're testing the bomb and you're rooting for it. You want it to go well. And then afterwards, you're kind of left with the questions of what did we just create and is it going to kill society? The Trinity test is like yeah. unbelievable. Hit, hit, me with the, hit me with the history terms because... It's just unbelievable. It's just unbelievable. The tension, the second time watching it, I was like, holy... This is when the big thing goes boom? Yeah. Okay. When they, mm. they test the bomb. I feel like the sound design was like breathtaking. Um, mm -hmm. And was that was like 
Good all work. I could focus on at that time. And I'm not Good. someone who usually like gets so crafty um, when it comes to those things. But I thought like everything about that scene was perfect. Yeah, that was definitely like the big wow moment. I thought it was so cool. I love how it's silent like the whole time. I thought that was great because, you know, when I first watched it, I just expected to just go like boom like explode so it kind of like circumvented like all of my expectations of what I thought was going to happen when it went silent so that was like really powerful for me it's really so silly that they just like wear goggles and lay uh, with their backs facing like is that <laughs> yeah. it that's all you need to do you're like all those guys got cancer there's no way I think for it's sure. just it's emblematic of how, I mean, as much as they knew, obviously they were incredibly intelligent in the fields of physics, but also I don't think they knew all that much. Like, it wouldn't surprise me if they came out wearing like bicycle helmets and shoulder pads or something to try and protect against this thing. Like, they really didn't have any concept of what it was going to do. Evelyn, just to your point about like, no one's stretching the Trinity, like just stretching those moments. And like, yeah, when when the sound drops out, and like you just kind of hear like Oppenheimer's breathing, um, yeah, it's incredible. And like I love what Nolan does with sound. To Anna's point, like, um, he like uses like the way it's recorded. It sounds like disembodied. Like, and even when the the bomb is exploding, he brings back in that dialogue when he's talking to Florence Pugh and he's reading from uh, the Bhagavad Gita. Got it. Um, and he's like, I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. Like he brings in that audio. So it's not, it's it's just like you can like hear like the breathing and like the ambience of that scene's room. And it's it's just like, I don't know, just like something about it like feels really cool. Eerie. Yeah, eerie. Yeah. Totally. Love it. It slaps. Benny Safty putting all that sunscreen on, then asking if it's rubbed in. Really Can good. I please talk about Benny Safty? Yeah, he's so good. Can I please talk about <laughs> yeah, him? Yeah, go for it. He's like one I of your guys, love... right? What'd you say? He's like one of your guys, I feel like. I feel like he you love my a, guy. I a love Safty him. joint. He's great. But I just love how like during like the second part of the movie, he's just like advocating nonstop. Like, why the fuck are we not just like building a bigger bomb? <laughs> <laughs> he's just like let's question. build a worse bomb he's like oh you want to build a nuclear bomb how about a hydrogen bomb <laughs> he's just, just like completely like let's just destroy everything and i just love that i love it so much yeah i love how he keeps going over to the chalkboard he draws one little circle and then he draws a bigger circle and he's like eh? <laughs> <laughs> um thoughts on when they fucking railroad Oppenheimer's ass, they try to get him. Yeah. Third act. What do we think? So good. So good. Third, well, what do we think? I feel bad. <laughs> lost, I'm like, lost my train of thought. I'm like, who's in this guy's corner? Like, what the fuck? Matt yeah. Damon? Yeah, I think, I think Killian Murphy's best acting came here. This is, and I mean, I thought he was incredible this whole time, and what a freaking movie to carry on your back. But I feel like... Maybe because the movie is so big that like kind of the quieter moments you were able to focus more on just how talented he is as an actor. Mm. Totally. Absolutely. Other thoughts, Ander? Evelyn? I think I've I've said my piece. Um this is a fantastic movie, uh, with a lot of wow moments. About um, the railroading man. We're the, not wrapping up. We got another hour to go. Oh my god, dude, this movie's so long. Yeah, the railroading's fine. They get his ass, and it, it doesn't <laughs> deserve it. Does it remind you of a time where you your ass was railroaded? No. Can you no. tell us about that time? <laughs> no, 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 no. That's for the after hours podcast. This is mm. this is the this is gonna air at a at a timely three p.m. Eastern. So this is a this is a children's podcast. <laughs> this is a children's <laughs> podcast. When we upload to YouTube, we do check the children's box. So kids love Argo. <laughs> Sponsored by PBS Kids. Absolutely. Kids love Silence of the Lambs. Kids love That's true. Silence of the famously. Lambs. Yeah. They did the statistics on that. Oh yeah, it's popular with fans of Bluey. Um. Evelyn, what do you think about the railroading? Andrew doesn't give a shit. He doesn't care about 
that Oppenheimer had to die for our sins. He's still I think, alive. I think in I'm Cuba. in agreement with Anna that this is probably my favorite part of the movie too. Um, I I love it. I think it's interesting watching like the repercussions of his decisions of everyone's decisions sort of like coming to a head. It's like, guys, this this boardroom bullshit, like you killed like hundreds of thousands of people and it's it's only going to keep going. Like, it's just like, it's crazy. It's like, let's talk about how um your history of communism. It's like, who fucking cares? Harry Truman's <laughs> PR team was livid after this came out. <laughs> That seems really good. Gary Oldman's so good at fucking as as Truman. He's like, don't let that cry baby back into my office. That's Gary Oldman. <laughs> yeah. Um. Any final thoughts on this film? Anything else anybody wants to say? Albert Einstein's here. He's really good. He pops up as like a little <laughs> phantom every once in a while. <laughs> He's adorable. I love yeah. him. What a Tom great Conti. little guy. I think uh, yet again we've seen one of the least interesting movies of the year win Best Picture. Ooh, see, I thought. See, last year you said you wanted Failments to win because it's like the normal Academy bullshit, and I feel like this is like normal Academy bullshit kind of. Did I say that I wanted the Failements to win last year? You said it was no, the kind I of movie not. you want to see win. Don't slander me like that. Slander. Don't slander, slander, and to roll back the tape. We'll, we'll cut it in. I don't think I said that. I did not like everything everywhere all at once, but I di I don't think I was rooting for the Fablements. I know you were a big fan of Triangle of Gladness. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That was so good. So good. Give me more of that. I think this movie like is weirdly, like it's kind of uncharacteristically impressionistic for Nolan. There's a lot of like getting, I, I think maybe because it's so subjective, like getting into Oppenheimer's head, like like you know when he after the the bomb is dropped on Nagasaki and Hir Hiroshima um Hiroshima uh, like and and like all those scientists are gathered at Los Alamos to like and they're like stomping like the sound uh, Evelyn to your to your point about the trinity test like the sound drops out again and like the fucking backgrounds like stuttering and like Oppenheimer like is seeing like this girl's like skin peeling off which is actually Nolan's daughter um ew yeah. I would hate to see that in my film. I think he's doing it because he has so much anxiety. Like, I think he's like, I need to make this personal somehow. Um, but, like, I think all those, like, subjective flourishes are really interesting and kind of uncommon for Nolan. I felt like the storyline was objective and it was very apolitical. And then the movie ends on, like, in my opinion, how I perceived it was, like, a very, like, anti-war, like, sentiment. So, like, I really liked that. And I guess that's kind of how I feel about the movie. Like, I like how it's like very apolitical and very um, like historical and to the point. And then like, I like how the ending had like this, to, what was to me a very like strong resounding, like anti-war, like anti-violence message. And uncle war and uncle violence. <laughs> that was really good. You had that written down, huh? Yeah, actually, it's, it's the only thing I have written in my notes, believe it or not. <laughs> Uncle War and Uncle Violence. I was just glad it came up. I feel like you have to end it right on just <laughs> Uncle War. <laughs> Who's your favorite uncle? <laughs> uncle Violence. <laughs> <laughs> Final thoughts, Ander, or what? I've said my piece. Um, I have no final thoughts that are worth any. They're my final thoughts are a waste of anyone's time. I'm not going <laughs> to oh, stop. Time. Holy shit! <laughs> um, I think this movie is a masterpiece. What what else can I say, Nolan? If you're free to have a little English breakfast tea, call me. I'm sure you will. Pick your brain. <laughs> Shut up, man. I don't think Christopher Nolan has any way of listening to podcasts. That's, that's a really good point. <laughs> he true. actually loves Joe Rogan. <laughs> you could maybe write him a letter. Yeah. Send it by fucking carrier pigeon. That would yeah. be nice. I'm sure he would love that. He seems like a good dad. What do we think? I don't know. I mean, he just put his daughter burning alive in a movie. So <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Jury's out. Fine. It seems like he's probably pretty busy. Because he's just <laughs> earning a good living. I'm sure his kids are happy. Yeah. They got a career in the film industry if they want one. Andrew, do you have, I think, a few games to play? <laughs> I do have a game, yeah. How well do we know Robert? 
Hmm? Pretty well, I guess. I watched the whole movie about it. <laughs> true, true. As did we all. I want to pick, pivot to a new segment that we have on the show. And uh, in, the, in the true essence of the show, I have no idea how this is going to go down. But it's going to be in the form of competition. It's called Oppenheimer or not Oppenheimer. We knew the world would Basically, not be the same. <laughs> I've got a series of quotes. Some from J. Robert Oppenheimer. Some from various other individuals. All you got to do is tell me, is it Oppenheimer or not? First quote is cookie. It's like, I think that's <laughs> Cookie Monster. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. That could be that easy. That could be added easy. If you're right. able to identify the person, do you get an extra point? If it's a Noppenheimer? If you can identify the Noppenheimer, I will give you an extra point. Yes. Okay. See, that I didn't even. Yeah. It's So the game is just, is it Oppenheimer or not? Not if who is it Oppenheimer or who is the other person? Right. You can it it's just Oppenheimer or not, nah, but if you can if it's a na nah and you can guess the other okay. person, I'll definitely give you a bonus point because that's I would be impressed. Cool. This is for this is for all y'all. So we're just okay. gonna go very quickly and be like, yes, yes, no. Okay. Are you ready? The people of this world must unite or they will perish. I'm Oppenheimer. Gonna no. I'm gonna say no. We got a no? Two no's. Evelyn? Uh, I'll go Oppenheimer to just to, to offset it. We can't put all of our eggs in one basket. To Oppenset it? <laughs> <laughs> yes, absolutely. We will say that. Uh, yes, that is J. Robert Oppenheimer. The people of this world must unite or they will perish. Very poignant. Nice job, J., whoever that stands for. Next quote. I, pr- <laughs> I promise. <laughs> I promised each and every Hulkamaniac when I get to that great battlefield in the sky, I would bring the WWF title with me. Um, I'm going to say Oppenheimer, I think. <laughs> I'm going to have to go Noppy on that. Anna? Noppy locking in my god, Hulk Hogan. <laughs> yes, that is in fact Hulk Hogan. Um, I haven't read these in a little bit, so I gave that one away, but these next ones, I'm going to be locked in. That was a tough one, though. That was a tough one, for sure. Insecurity exists in the absence of knowledge. All security derives from knowledge. Kind of smart. I'm going to say I'm going to say Oppenheimer. I'm going Oppenheimer. I'll go Oppenheimer, too. Uh, actually, that is famed Scientologist founder L. Ron Hubbard. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Which is pretty, I don't know, it was a nice quote. Uh, L. Ron Hubbard also did say, All men shall be my slaves, all women shall succumb to my charms, and all mankind shall grovel at my feet and not know why. So, truly Sorry. a complicated individual. Just just cut just cut the part where I say that's a really good quote. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think that'll stay in. Why? <laughs> How about, sometimes the questions are complicated and the answers are simple. I think that might be like John Green. Say not Oppenheimer as well. That sounds like the author of Paper Towns for sure. Um, no, I I feel like since you've done, like, is this the th- Don't try to game it, dude. Say, I'm going to say Oppenheimer. Nope, it is not Oppenheimer. You guys are very close. It's actually Dr. <laughs> Seuss who said that. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes the questions are complicated and the answers are simple. But who said genius sees the answer before the question? Now I'm like caught, I'm caught between a rock and a hard place. I'm gonna say Quentin not Tarantino Hammer. said that. Mm. Can you repeat the quote? Genius sees the answer before the question. I'll say Oppenheimer. I'm gonna say Oppenheimer, but also that quote is is false. That's never been true. It goes right, so against that's... the very idea of a scientific method. Yeah, that's like that's like a thing a smart person will. Say. That's like a thing somebody said, but like it doesn't actually make sense. That is J. Robert Oppenheimer, so I don't know what that says about <laughs> this movie. I'm good individual. at this game. <laughs> Definitely. Who, who, how many points do we all have? I have zero, I think. I, Mike, you might have zero. I will tabulate it at the end, honestly, in the recording, because I have not been keeping track. Who said, I'm real good with math, with numbers like my dad was. I'm pretty much dialed in. I think that was you, man. I feel like that's like a Matt Damon movie. I can't. Well, who said that? 
Uh, that's actually Hulk Hogan again. <laughs> no way! <laughs> and yes, he is good with math and numbers, like his father was. That's incredible. <laughs> How about who said, I do not fear retribution from my creator. On the contrary, it is God that should fear what I have created. It's gotta be not, Oppenheimer. Not Oppenheimer. Oppenheimer. It's like uh, John Bon Jovi. No, that one is some shit that I did make up. Uh, so that's an Andrew original. Is that true? It's kind of yeah. smart. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, man. <laughs> Two left. It's perfectly obvious that the whole world, the whole world is going to hell. The only possible chance that it might not is that we do not attempt to prevent it from doing so. Oppenheimer. I'm gonna go Oppenheimer. I'll say Oppenheimer. I guess. Clean sweep. That is J. Robert Oppenheimer. Very nice. Michael, your first point. Nice job, Mike. Very Thanks good. For, Thanks for saying that. <laughs> Okay, um, I'll close it out. Who said, this one's for 800 points. When you want to do something, do it right away. Do it when you can. It's the only way to live life without regrets. I'm going to say you. <laughs> Not Oppenheimer. Not Oppenheimer. Uh, yeah, that's Sonic the Hedgehog. Um, truly the most inspirational hedgehog there ever was. Weirdly, him and Oppenheimer are sort of the most foundational American figure. Well, I guess, I guess is Sonic, is that from Japan? Uh, kind of. It's a kind of a collab. Actually. Sega? I don't truly, know. Truly, yeah. Truly bridging the gap between the East and West, Sonic the Hedgehog. Incredible. Yeah. Oppenheimer couldn't do it, but fucking Sonic the Hedgehog did. <laughs> Gotta go <laughs> fast. Speaking of going fast, <laughs> should we go to the nominees? Yeah. So, Andrew, you had the idea, obviously, of us all kind of reading one off. I'm going to, I have the list pulled up on the Oscars website. I assume we all know which ones we're going to synopsize. Yes. So I'm just going to go down the list. And if your movie comes up, the floor is yours. Okay. Um, so obviously Oppenheimer won Best Picture. Um, everybody screamed and cried. Before we, can I ask you a question first? Was Oppenheimer Fine. anyone's favorite movie that came out this year? It was one of mine. After I watched it the second time, it was one of mine. Okay. It was one of my favorites, yeah, but it wasn't my favorite. Okay, fair enough. It was uh, it was bottom of the barrel for me. <laughs> my uh, my favorite movie this year didn't even get nominated. My favorite movie was May December. Oh, okay. Um, I never I haven't seen that yet. I watch so, that. Good. If, so good. So good. Um, if Todd we get Haynes to our... snubbed Sorry, again. Dude. Just an absolute. What happened in, to that movie? It should have been nominated for Best Picture. Should have been nominated. A couple acting categories. It was really, really sad to see. But it... that was my favorite movie of the year. If we, if we do happen to get to our last segment, we that may come up. So we'll see. May December. Okay, Potentially, can't... yes. Wait. Um. Evelyn, what was your favorite movie this year before we get into the nominees? Uh, my favorite movie of 2023 was Anatomy of a Fall. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Should we start there? Transition point. I guess let's just start there. Okay. <laughs> What's this thing um, about? Take it away. So, yeah, Anatomy of a Fall nominated for uh, Best Picture. And I'm, like, I think like almost like, like a, a lot of other categories too. Um. Directed by Justine Triet, Trier, I think. Um, also won the Palme d'Or at the Cannes um, Film Festival. Um, this was her first Oscar nomination, like round. I think I don't think she's ever been nominated for an Oscar not an Oscar before. Um, but it's st starring Sandra Huller, who or Huller who plays um, a mother and a wife, and she is suspected of killing her husband, who had fallen out of a window or been pushed, um, depending on who you ask, because <laughs> did she do it? Did she do it? We don't know. We don't know. Who knows? But... Um, her son is uh, visually impaired and the only witness to what may or may not have happened. And um, 
It's amazing. It's incredible. It is one of the best movies I think I've ever seen in my life. One of my favorite movies that I saw of last year. Just incredible. I love the way it's filmed. I love the music. I love the acting. I I love how like there's like archival footage shoved into it. Like I love how like there's real like photos in this movie. Like I just love everything. And it just felt like such a labor of love. And Justine Trier said that like she wrote this like during the pandemic. So I mean, I feel like I feel like a lot of really great art like came out of the pandemic. So like that kind of like that um, made a lot of sense for me, like why this movie was so good, because like this like came out of like such like a dark period for like a lot of people. Yeah, so totally. just an amazing movie. Can we so, talk yeah. about how good that dog acting was. Go for, yeah. Have really you good. ever seen better dog acting? Oh, when that's, the dog is poisoned, well, like how is it so good? I've been watching true. a lot of behind the scenes of Messi and his trainer, <laughs> and just how he got to where, like how his his body weight is all he lost it all. The tongue coming out was like a later addition. Like they trained him to do it. They're like, "Hey, Messi, can you uh, do this real quick?" And he's like, "Yeah, let me see if I got that in my bag." Well, they started off just teaching him to play dead. And then eventually, like, the tongue got added. But wow. it, it all sparked one day when Messi was just learned, like, he was so exhausted from playing in the yard with the ball. And that's kind of, they built upon that exhaustion to get him to his overdose acting abilities. We've all been there. But yeah. I think this was my, one of my favorites of the year, too. I, I feel like I was thinking about this movie more than any of the other movies that came out this year i kept coming back to it and the fact that we couldn't see what happened just like her son couldn't see what happened but are kind of forced to make a decision i thought the way they filmed that was such a like impressive way to use the medium in a way that catapulted the story and i keep screaming you are not the victim <laughs> Yeah, this this thing rips. This thing is it's it's really good. It's pitch perfect from a drama perspective, and uh, it's awesome. I love I love the depiction of French like court. Uh, like people are just like reading novels. It's like yeah, she said on page two hundred of this novel that she made up that this, and it's like okay, so what? <laughs> it was relevant to the case, I guess. No, that movie's really good. Hell yeah, the American fiction directed well i guess you could say who it's directed by if you'd like uh, i don't think i can um but i'll tell you what it's about <laughs> um, okay, let me pull this up because you i have to fucking do everything around here <laughs> excuse me um, your check is or jefferson mail. directed it uh yeah starring a um uh starring that guy from uh french dispatch yeah jeffrey Wright. yeah <laughs> jeffrey Wright. yeah french He's really dispatch, great the worst wes anderson movie what <laughs> Wow. He's absolute worst one. Really? Yes. I, I disagree. It's one of my least favorite, but I, I don't know if it, I agree that it's his worst. I really but... like the French Dispatch. Yeah, me too. It's the numbers, like the bottom of my list for it's West It's below Anderson. zero. <laughs> yeah. American Fiction. One. American Fiction is about the uh, about Thelonious Monk Ellison, who's a author. And he's just generally pissed a lot about a lot of different things. Um, he's pissed about the popularity of books that take advantage of uh, blackness and oversimplification of the black experience. Um, and he's so pissed that he decides to write a book just like that. Um, and of course, he does it kind of as a fuck you to publishers and to society. But sure enough, publishers are like, oh, yeah, this book is so good. We got to We got to publish this shit. And it, it's it was good. There are a lot of um, charming character moments in it. Um, there's a lot of humor that I didn't expect. Um, at one point he's on the phone arguing with the publishers and he's like, you know what? I'm going to read I'm, I'm only re doing it if I rename the book. Fuck. <laughs> and he's like, yeah, that'll cancel the deal for sure. And they're like, yeah, we love it. It's so good. It's going to be great. Um, it's got a bizarre ending that I kind of love. They end it like three different ways. Um, and it was it was good. Um, there weren't a ton of like wow moments or vivid iconography, but it's a nice, simple story. Um, 
that has mm. more meaning to it uh, than meets the eye. I did not like this movie. No, it why not? It was definitely my least favorite out of all of them. I just felt it was pretty plain, kind of like what you were saying, like it is in iconography, but like I just felt like it was a very plain story in general, too. Like the first like 20 to 30 minutes, I was like, am I like going to be walking out of this movie theater? I was like, this is boring. <laughs> but you're right. There are some funny and also sweet moments in it, which I really liked. But overall, this Oscar season, I was like campaigning so hard for a thousand and one to win and not to win, to be nominated for best picture. And I would have much rather have seen a thousand and one specifically in American fiction's place. I loved American fiction. I thought it was one of the most like rewatchable of Ooh. the best pictures. Um, one thing that took me out of it was the main character calls his mom mother. I, which, I'm so glad that, yeah. Which that throws me off in any movie, but I like that, but it bugged me particularly in this movie. I think because you were supposed to feel that they were so close and connected that it may, it, there's a formality to it that I think actually did the characters a disservice. See, um, I took it the opposite way. I kind of, I got the sense that they were a little bit far apart. And that's maybe why he called her mother. But I, I'm true. with you. Yeah. Next up, we have. I don't know if you guys have heard the heard of this one. I think it's I think it's German. Uh, I don't know if I'm saying it right. Barbie. <laughs> I love yeah, that me. Andrew gave me the girl movies. <laughs> yeah. What the fuck, know. man? <laughs> he gave me Barbie and poor things. So I was like, well, I get it. He gave me the movies that are like, oh, this is like the movies that fucking stupid guys who like movies like. And then right? you I was saying like you could trade. Old... I'm sorry. No, I appreciate it. I mean, Barbie and Poor Things pretty much have the same plot. So it makes it very easy for me. <laughs> They're the same movie, just one of them told by Greta Gerwig and the other one told by a man. Um, but yeah, Barbie, we have the blockbuster of the summer. Uh, we have, you know, Barbie, the girl we all know and love, kind of going through her coming of age story. And we're, we're talking about themes of criticisms of modern femininity and masculinity. This is a movie I have watched a few times now. Um, the only of these movies I have purchased, because I just keep going back to it, I think it is a very simplistic criticism of femininity in a way that at first um, really, or feminism in a way that at first upset me. But now I think she was kind of going for people who um, haven't been having these conversations a lot. And I think it is an approachable movie to like look at some issues within our society through this movie I don't think Barbie's gonna like heal the world's issues but I think for people who maybe don't think about the way gender plays into their everyday lives this is an interesting movie to kind of like have your first little gander I feel like yeah. it's great for like a intro to feminism class like first week of college totally kind of gets the job done yeah and I think I can actually speak uh, best about this I <laughs> <laughs> um no I do think I like I agree with what you're saying. I do think the movie I've I've only seen it once and I love it. It's one of my favorite movies of the year. I think it's Greta Gerwig is just like one of my favorite like Little Bird, Lady Bird's like top 10 favorite movies. Um Little Women is like one of the most perfect movies ever made. Um Barbie I do think like in my memory it is a, it is like a it's like kind of simplifying stuff or at least like kind of stripping stuff down as as much as possible like about feminism and, and gender roles and stuff there are parts that have me actually laugh out loud the music is great i think honestly like it's a it's a good movie i just even i had i think my expectations set to an unfair level for this movie where Kind of conversations afterward i was like okay well it didn't go far enough or like that america ferrera monologue 
she wasn't saying anything new that felt like she hadn't read like any real like feminist literature and then i was like well i guess that's not the point like this is a blockbuster movie um that millions of people are going to see maybe it is good that she's kind of going at it from like an approachable place and i 1000 percent agree because I feel like Greta Gerwig doesn't, she doesn't like owe us highbrow feminism with Barbie because like, you know, like Barbie isn't like highbrow like art, like it's a children's toy. So like, why not like come at feminism, like you said, like through like an accessible way where like anyone can enjoy it. Cause you know, like maybe someone who like has no idea about feminism stumbles upon this movie and then like decides to like look more into feminism or whatever just you know diversity equal rights you know i really think it's just like a perfect movie i really loved it it's so rewatchable so rewatchable sorry andrew you said you hated it yeah i think it uh actually sucks ass um i think uh i agree with ken (laughs) i thought it was good (laughs) because ken was right it's all about (laughs) horses and men and trucks (laughs) no it's great i loved it so much uh the part where she where she enters the real world and she's just noticing all the, the little simple things about life. It's so beautiful. Um, great movie. Fun movie. Yeah, where, where she just looks at the old lady on the bench and they just kind of like smile at each other. I'm like, this is like, what? This movie is incredible. Yeah. Well, you know so who sweet. that old lady is too, right? No, who is it? That's the daughter of the inventor of Barbie. That's Barbara Handler. That's fucking crazy. Right? Like, Barbie was named after that woman, Barbara Handler right so her mo- that's the girl who inspired barbie right it's on and that now bench she takes, so and now lovely. she takes the bus <laughs> now she takes the bus now she's working class How's <laughs> now that she lo- and the fact that she looks at barbie and says like you're so beautiful it's just like yeah. so uh, everything about that movie just chef's kiss i hope we see that universe expanded although that movie's still perfect i kind of just want it to be left alone next up we have one of my favorite movies of the year the holdovers oh yes giamatti paul giamatti plays paul hunnam he's a uh, teacher at a uh boarding school like a new at new england prep school uh in the 70s it's like 1971 i think and um it's christmas break and he's forced to look after the remaining boys who aren't going home for Christmas. It's, I think it's like, it starts out as being like, I think six boys. Um, one of them being sort of the other, one of the other main characters. Angus Tully is the character's name played by Dominic Sessa. Um, and he's there with, so there are some boys at first, they eventually leave to go skiing. Um, what a what a brilliant little rug pull that was. That blew my mind. <laughs> It's like it's like forty minutes in. I was like, "Oh, I thought the whole movie was going to be like this little group," but it's like, "Oh, they're gone now." Um, Every trailer so had them. Like, I thought it was yeah. going to be like a a, a a cast of wacky characters who settle their differences, but no, they're literally airlifted out of the movie. Yeah, <laughs> amazing. Um, <laughs> yeah. So then it's Paul Giamatti, uh, Dominic Sessa, and uh, Divine Joy Randolph, who plays Mary Mary Lamb. Um, she's the the head cook at the school. Um, and they're just kind of it after those boys go skiing, it's uh just these three at the prep school, and they're sort of their conversations, they're like it's kind of weird, it's episodic, it's sort of just like them being put in situations where there's like tension or there's like they're under trying to understand each other, and it's just like the fucking I love a movie set at Christmas. I love a movie where people are like forced to get along, like if you spend enough time with somebody, I mean. You know, obviously there's exceptions, but if you spend enough time with somebody, I do think it's like the the capacity for connection and empathy is like, you know, is incredible. And I think this movie is really good at capturing that. Um, and uh, yeah, it's one of my favorites of the year. I think it's so beautiful. And so it's funny. It's like very sweet. It feels like it's like five acts. It's like over two hours. I like how kind of gangly it is. Um and more movies should be just like kind of chill and normal like this instead of like this movie does so much and takes its characters across so much like it had the arcs of of, of their characters are so wide and big and but and movies 
barely sometimes barely think about their characters i yeah. loved this movie i love alexander oh, yeah. Payne. i thought this was his best movie i've seen in a while this is the one movie that i feel like you could recommend to anyone and they will enjoy uh, I think it was also the only movie this year that made me cry. And yeah. I am a frequent crier in movies, but this was really the one that pulled at my heartstrings the most. And I thought the characters and the way they interacted was really beautiful. I also loved that it shouted out my favorite drink, Miller High Life. So it really had everything I, I could want. The champagne of beers. The champagne of beers. That's and any, any, any thoughts on the holdovers? Yeah, it's it's a very simple, sweet movie. Uh, it's very good. I almost feel similarly. Um, That's funny. Uh, you gave it a uh, three stars on uh, Letterboxd. Yeah, three stars there. is good. Three stars is nice. Three stars is bad. Three stars is rice. <laughs> three stars is bad. I think three stars is good. Uh, that's three just my stars scale. Is bad. No, I three disagree. Stars is good right. to me. <laughs> really? Interesting. Three stars is like I I enjoyed watching this. Um, I'd probably recommend this to another human being. That's three stars to me. Would you recommend it to Messi? Messi can watch all the movies he wants. Messi, Messi has to watch Air Bud first. It's really a, a staple for him. I thought it was very cozy. Um, I watched it with my mom, which was nice. I liked yeah. watching it with my mom. It just felt like a very good family movie. Um, definitely agree. I feel like anyone could like this. You could recommend it to anyone. Um, Paul Giamatti is the lead actor's name. Mm -hmm. Oh my God. He's acting his ass off in this. He's so good. He's so serious, but like, oh my God, he's genius. That I, lazy eye should have won an Oscar. Absolutely. And I couldn't figure out, oh, was, there was for like the first hour. I'm like, is that Paul Giamatti's real eye? <laughs> like, does he have a lazy eye? I just couldn't place it. Um, yeah, his acting is really he good. He's, he's he was wearing a contact that he actually like couldn't. It made him unable to see out of that eye. Hmm. Oh shit! Dominic Sessa, I thought was so good. Um, I feel like he's going to have a really big career ahead of him because he like disappeared in this character. I wanted there to be more romance between him and that girl in that party because they were so cute. You sicko! I love. They're children. <laughs> I'm just saying it's cute. I'm not saying like, <laughs> I'm not saying I love when teens kiss. I'm saying it's cute uh, that they were like. I'm saying it's cute. Like I, I like like young love. I think it's cute. Fucking yeah. Christ! Don't try and catch me in something. Sorry, what was that again? Can you just is it a young? Love, I said I like teens? when teens kiss. Okay, got it. Okay, perfect. <laughs> Chris Hansen is on the way to this podcast. <laughs> Next podcast. Sorry, there's somebody. Nobody's knocking at my door. <laughs> he's going to be on the Lolita episode as an expert. He's like, how, he's like, do you like this movie? He's like staring at my little box <laughs> Zoom thing. Um, <laughs> Killers of the Flower Moon. Wow. The Long. next nominee. Um, just an absolute fucking barn burner if there ever was one uh directed by martin scorsese um a very short movie about a very complicated period of american history <laughs> um no it's about uh leonardo DiCaprio's the capri leonardo DiCaprio's character ernest burkhart he uh moves to oklahoma um on like what is osage land but like there are like this movie's a little bit fuzzy to me because it was long and I saw it a while ago. <laughs> but um, Robert uh, Robert De Niro is like sort of the head guy of this community and they're all like pulling up oil on Osage land. Um, but they're also like a lot of these like white guys are like secretly killing the Osage in order to like take their land so they can get more oil, I think is what's going on. Um, and... Ernest Burkhart falls in love with uh, Lily Gladstone's character, um, Molly. I think that's debatable. Falls yeah. in love is quite debatable. That's true. They have they have a they have a they have a romance. Um, also debatable, I guess. But they have a romance, and it it's the movie's largely like these murders happening in the background. Meanwhile, this like marriage sort of becomes a microcosm of the macrocosm. Um, 
and it's like the tension of Molly is married to a guy who like says he loves her but I think just kind of wants to like take her land so that he can fucking make money off the oil underneath it um, and it's good it's a fucking incredible goddamn movie um, I've only it's very dense um, I sat through all three and a half hours without pissing which is really good nice um, it's Robert, Robert De Niro is so good in this movie Arguably, he should have won Best Supporting Actor, but um, I I wholeheartedly disagree. I don't think he was that great, actually. I don't think he was that good either. <laughs> I thought he was good. I thought he was scary. I was he's, scared of him. I thought good, Leonardo but... DiCaprio was incredible, though. Yeah, totally. Playing the stupidest man in history. <laughs> but I didn't. But like, he just has such this this innate ability to disappear into a role. Like, I truly believed that. I, like I didn't see Leonardo DiCaprio, I saw his character. I, I if I looked at Robert De Niro, I'm like, oh, there goes Bobby, Bobby De Niro. D. Yeah, yeah. There goes oh, really? Bobby D. See, I feel like as of late, Robert De Niro has just been doing a lot of like, he's like the Italian kind of grumpy dad to like Sebastian Maniscalco, and that's, and that's like fine. a lot of what he's doing recently. So I think in this, he actually like fought. He like he becomes enveloped by his character and actually like is doing a performance instead of just like playing grumpy guy. The ending felt like it was a bit of a cop out for me. Are you talking about when Marty shows up in person? When Marty shows up. Yeah. And I think the fact that it didn't really have a movie esque ending, I think actually lends credence to its message, you know, because it, it was a lot like real life. If it had this um, cinematic wrap up, I don't think it would have been true to the original story. Um, I don't think it needed Marty. I think, no. honestly, if it just ended kind of more on a subtle note, it, it would have been closer to real life. It, I've I've landed on, yeah, you're right. It, he, it didn't need him, <laughs> but the fact that I'm just like, you know what? Martin Scorsese, can, he's done enough in his career where he, if he wants to show up in his own movie and, t- and tell us that the movie's really good, fine, go right ahead. Like, you've earned that right. Just go off, dude. That's fair. I, I love when Marty pops up in his own movies. Also, I think, honestly, the last... Jack White is there for some reason. Fucking Colin... Firth. <laughs> I wanted to say Conan O'Brien, but I didn't say that. Is Colin Firth there? No. Oh. Why are you yanking my chain like that? <laughs> so you had... The Jack White thing was really good, and I wanted to one-up you, but I couldn't in the no, end. No, Jack White was actually there. Yeah, dude. Oh, is he actually there? He's actually in the movie, yeah. Okay, are, now oh, are you yanking weird. my chain, or no? I didn't know that. No, he shows up remember, and reads a lot. His pale little face. <laughs> he is ghostly, to be sure. <laughs> so I love like the first two hours of this movie, and then like once the FBI shows up, I think it becomes a little bit maybe like dramatically inert because it's like the FBI is questioning people who we know did the crime, and we're just sort of watching them be like like lie and like lie badly and i'm like is this interesting i'm pretty neutral on it i feel like it's i feel like it's good it's solid i um i didn't see it obviously winning best picture when you know oppenheimer's in the category um i feel like if oppenheimer wasn't in the category like this this probably would have won and but um I just, I don't know. It's just something about the movie I don't like. I just don't feel like very um, connected to. Any of you read the book? Yeah. And yeah, arguably well, that, the, the book this was wasn't more our book cinematic. Club. Yeah. Well, that this, that was the, that was the whole, t- well, like, originally when Scorsese was developing this, it was like DiCaprio was going to play um, the FBI guy. Um, but then they, like thankfully they sort of thought about it and we're like do we need another like western where like a guy comes in and saves like you know people of color um and so they switched it and like homed in on the uh the marriage between molly and ernest um <laughs> ernst ernest um definitely ernest we're gonna move on to past lives oh <laughs> past okay lives Somebody rang. Okay. Oh, hold on. <laughs> Sorry. Got too excited. Unplugged my headset. Um, Past Lives freaking rips. 
in fact, I kind of flirted with the idea of maybe Past Lives wins Best Picture. You did text could, that to me, and I was like, there's no way. I, t- I said that to Anna, too. I was like, I was trying to spread the word and be like, <laughs> just in case it happens, I, will, I want the credit for this. Because um, I, I see it as um, almost in a, de- a perfect evolution of, for context, we've reviewed and watched a lot of really shitty um, <laughs> three-way romances in this uh, best picture exercise. Um, this feels like... It, the perfect evolution of that style of film um past lives uh is about a korean american woman named nora uh who leaves korea at a very early age um she leaves behind her childhood friend named hey sung i believe um they were kind of childhood uh friends and uh were, were were very closely connected um she has this whole life in new york now um, and she has her a, a husband of 12 years, but now Hey Sung comes back to the country. Um, it's just really riveting from a character standpoint. And the soundtrack in this thing fucking slaps. Like if you just gave me the soundtrack to this and said, there's a movie attached to it, I would be blown away. Um, cause the music is, is just so, so good. Um, and I really liked it. Yeah. I love this one. It's one I keep thinking about. I think the way they talk about language is really so interesting. That scene where um, her husband's talking about how she dreams in Korean and sometimes speaks out loud and he can't access that part of her, I thought was just really beautiful. And that scene at the bar, the way it's shot. Yeah. Um, so good. Also, maybe the best like husband in a movie we've seen ever. That no man... One- is in the wrong like every character is is doing just fine by themselves you know what i mean yep yep they're Which all good Which makes it all the more devastating yeah i love um inyan i think that's what it was called i loved inyan like as a plot device and i thought like it worked yeah. so well and i think that was probably my favorite part of the movie it's shot on film and it fucking shows hell least, yeah every new york movie should be shot on film Mm. there are a um, bunch of there are a bunch of scenes where i'm watching i'm like oh shit i live like two minutes from here <laughs> so i guess that was cool to see i don't know if that enhances the movie experience but it did for me so yeah i liked that i really liked hearing about how um they shot it and how the scenes of them seeing each other in real life were the first time they had actually ever seen each other in real life really? i thought yeah i thought that was super interesting and the the husband in all of their time, the husband and the love and the two guys yeah. in the time um, they had never seen what each other looked like until their first scene together. So I feel like those were really interesting. I love that. Yeah. It adds to the authenticity of it for sure. Yeah. Yeah. I almost wanted more Hey Sung and Nora walking around talking because I feel like their conversations once they get together in New York feel kind of limited. I feel like it's true to life, though, how how limited those conversations were because you can't overstep on the bounds of your own marriage. You know what I mean? Like Arthur's Arthur's on this date with them, basically, and he's just kind of sitting there awkwardly, you know, trying to be encouraging, but also you could tell he's having a hard time because you know they're speaking korean and he knows that's something that even though he's tried to he's made earnest attempts to connect with her he he can't capture that yeah good shit i guess i'm wrong i no, you're not wrong you're just we're, we're just coming at it from two different angles i guess i'm bad i guess maybe in a past life you were right so sorry, past live Celine song. Come on the podcast. You probably won't, but I'd love to have you. Um, poor, poor things. Who has poor things? Okay, I have poor things. Poor things is basically Barbie, the Barbie movie, just told by a man. It's a virgin entering a new world and kind of coming, growing up. Uh, we have Bella Baxter, and she is a baby brain in the body of her mother Love and, it. but she herself is pretty much motherless and basically we see bella baxter grow up and as she's doing that we're also 
exploring evolution of thought and going through like the enlightenment and romanticism and transcendentalism and socialism and 20th century thought and there's also a lot of nipples um i think this yeah i haven't seen it there's nipple (laughs) huh excuse me (laughs) i think this is the most naked of the best pictures yeah um i enjoyed it but i thought it was a little i thought it was a little on the nose um i i thought the references to frankenstein were interesting and cool um but i it's one i don't need to see again yeah what did you guys think i agree it it's it was fun to see because I saw it in the theater. It was fun to get like everybody's yeah. shocked reactions to everything. There was a lot of shock and awe. And I feel like maybe on rewatch, it won't play as well necessarily. Mm. Um, but it was definitely entertaining for sure. I thought it was great. I thought it was hilarious. I was laughing so hard during this movie. And kind of like you were saying about shock, um, after the first sex scene, which is very graphic, very very intense it's it's it, there's sex um <laughs> and old people uh, an old couple immediately got up and left and never came back during the movie that was my favorite part of the whole movie <laughs> was the old couple leaving from my theater um, i will say out. i'll watch mark ruffalo do anything i love that man so much i look forward to watching poor things i think it's on hulu now shout out to hulu plus in europe <laughs> Huh? In Europe, it's on Disney Plus. Are you serious? Yes. God, they do crazy shit over there. <laughs> <laughs> They're always up to weird stuff. Second to last, we got. Yeah, let's do it. We got Zone of Interest. Who's got it? Moi, me. I have Zone of Interest. Um. Okay. Uh, Zone of Interest uh, is directed by Jonathan Glazer. Um. Also director of Under the Skin, which is an amazing movie. Very, very um, similar vibes to um, The Zone of Interest. Uh, Starring starring Miss Sandra Huller again and um, a bunch of other uh, white people. I don't know their names (laughs) besides Sandra Huller because she's an icon and such a good actress in this too. But so the premise of the film is about um a family of a high-ranking um nazi official and uh they live next to auschwitz pretty much in auschwitz like literally like right next to auschwitz and it's about how they've created this very idyllic life for themselves in this gorgeous mansion on gorgeous grounds like right next to like possibly like the most horrific abomination of like human history that's ever happened and um it's kind of about just how evil can just like move in silence like parallel to exactly what they're doing like they're Mm. living amongst this horror like just (laughs) completely um unfazed they're just they're going swimming they're i think canoeing at some point they're harvesting vegetables on like the same ground where like people have not eaten for like weeks um so it's uh it's a tough watch in that sense because it's very eerie you feel like because it's like you know what's going on even yeah. though you never really see what's actually happening this movie scared the shit out of me not just in terms of like obviously the content of it is is terrifying but even just viscerally like the sounds like i've i've i fucking was like <laughs> i had to like close the curtains and shit they have the weird black screens as end caps that lady comes in singing like opera i'm like what the fuck it's kind of a horror movie i love the um black screens a lot because i felt like it kind of served as like a rest for like us as the audience to be like what is actually going on right now i did not feel like we're watching like just like these people like live out their day-to-day lives like happily but like 
there's like literally like bodies burning next door. So like I thought like those black screens were so, so effective. And I, I, that honestly, like, I can't believe I'm like, I'm like talking about a black screen and how much I love a (laughs) fucking black screen right now. But they're so good. It's just, it's a really good movie. Oh, there was also the red screen too. And the red screen was scary. And the maroon screen. I don't even I don't even know what that I missed that part. That's director's cut or something. You had your hands over your eyes. <laughs> I couldn't see it. Yeah, I um, think this one this is eerie. Like this movie was eerie and the way that they shot it I thought was a really effective use of the medium. Um and I'm glad it even though I did say that I thought Oppenheimer was gonna win for sound, I'm glad that this one for sound because that movie is so sound. Yeah. Like the story is told on- through the yeah. sound. Uh, I like what Jonathan Glazer said in his best international picture speech. History repeats itself. All right, should we talk about the last film? Yeah, hit me. Maybe, arguably, what should have won. It's Outer. Bradley Cooper's Maestro. Um, <laughs> in which, uh, in which, he tries to answer the question we've we've all wondered. Who left Snoopy in the vestibule? <laughs> Who did leave Snoopy in the vestibule? Um, no, it's about like the marriage between uh, Leonard Bernstein, Bernstein, I think actually it's pronounced, Leonard Bernstein and uh, his wife, Felicia Montalegra, um, played by Carrie Mulligan. Um, it's sort of, listen, Bradley Cooper I sort of admire how serious he is about being an auteur. He's like, I take movies seriously. And if you don't get the fuck away from me, he's doing <laughs> different fucking aspect ratios. He's doing black and white and color. You know, he's like, he's wearing the makeup. He's doing the voice. Yeah. So it's just sort of about the complicated marriage between Felicia and Leonard. Um, you know, he was sort of a, quasi closeted gay man um it's like everybody it was sort of like the secret that everybody knew it seems like at least by the way the movie tells it um and just their struggles with him sort of sleeping with men felicia sort of having to bear that um weight and also like it's a it's it's a movie both of Bradley Cooper's movies are about the movies he's directed are about fame and like how fucking fucked up it is to be famous um which I think is interesting I definitely like this movie probably more than maybe anybody else here I know Ander hates it uh, no, I, I think hate it's, it I think I it's, think it kind of stinks I think it's good but I don't know if there's enough like meat on the bone there, even if I kind of like that Bradley Cooper is doing a lot of stuff in this movie. Yeah, I love Bradley Cooper and I loved A Star is Born. So I had really high expectations for this movie and was just really disappointed. Um, I feel like I was left with the wrong questions. Um, Like I wasn't left with interesting questions. They were mainly just plot questions. I mean, this is about Leonard Bernstein. I don't even, I feel like I know less about him having seen it than going in. I should be, you know, I should be, I should be like, as soon as it ends, as soon as the credits are, I should be like, damn, I got to go listen to Leonard Bernstein. But nah, I, it kind of falls flat. Yeah, like, I also feel like it didn't, I mean, we had that one like weird musical number where he was also like dancing around with the cast of On the Town, but. I feel like there were missed opportunities for things like that. And that felt like it didn't measure up to the like scale of the musicals. Yeah. I actually, I liked this movie. Um, Similar to you, Anna, I love Bradley Cooper and I love A Star is Born as well. Um, And I, when I first heard about this movie, I was excited to see it. And then when I saw like reactions about it kind of starting to flood and I was like, Oh, like, I'm not really interested. Like whatever. Like I'm not going to go see it. Um, and then I watched it and I was pretty pleasantly surprised. I was like, this isn't as bad as other people are saying, like, this is good. Um, but I guess kind of like 
to like wrap up like how I feel about it was kind of what Jessica Lang said about this movie at the Oscars, which was she said, oh, this movie wouldn't be the same without Carrie Mulligan. Mm-hmm. Which I completely agree because wow, wow, Carrie Mulligan. I like was not expecting like what she did in this movie. I it was so powerful to me. I loved her in this movie. She's really incredible. Yeah, she was really good in it. Listen, I want Bradley Cooper to keep making movies. I think Star Wars One is really good. Also, I really like that movie. Um, I just like that he's fucking a little like. Have you guys seen the the video of him like asking questions at the actor's studio or whatever? He's like a yes. twenty something. He's like a little fucking nerd. He's like, um, hi, Mr. Junior. I'm happy to be here. Um, you do this thing in this movie where you like, and like, he's, I'm like, you're such a fucking loser. Shut up and sit down. <laughs> What's that impression, Michael? He doesn't sound like that at all. He's more like, hey, Bradley Cooper. Um, so Mr. De Niro. It's pretty good. Nerd. Um, <laughs> dork. But also, I kind of, I, wa- I want people to take it shit seriously more. People like, movies are important, and he, he, takes it seriously even if maestro isn't it i like that bradley cooper's making them making a maestro try again brad yeah like we will pay to see you try again i would love ander if bradley cooper did like a you know a lot of uh, around award season they always do like these you know they'll have like q and a's and they'll screen their movie i would love for you to be in the audience and pull a bradley cooper and be like hey mr cooper so nice to be here um and like just absolutely roast his ass I no, I like Bradley Cooper. I'm not gonna roast his ass. I just You're like, um did... sir, why'd you make a bad movie? <laughs> Listen, I'm not <laughs> saying I'm not saying stop making movies, definitely keep going. But this one was not my favorite, that's all. I think favorite Bradley Cooper movie Hangover Two is born Silver Linings Playbook. That's why you and me are friends, man. That's right. Yeah, Silver Linings Playbook's good. <laughs> <laughs> Should we move on? Yeah. Do you want to do your final game? <laughs> no, I'm going to cut the game for the sake of time, but I'm going to show it just because um, I'm going to have this available in the description. I th- I'm going to set up a link where you can uh, download this if you want to play it at home. It's on miniclip.com. <laughs> <laughs> it's, of course, on miniclip.com. No, it's uh, in, in the spirit of the season. Um, you know, I know everybody loves sports, I'm sure. Uh, oh, my God. Oh Basically, my God, this would have taken so long. Yeah, it would have taken a really <laughs> long time. I expanded it too. It was gonna be short. Uh, we'll cut it. But if you want to download this, you can. It's in the description. Um, because not everyone's favorite movie is nominated for Best Picture. Um, and if your favorite movie is not listed here, um, I want you to do me a favor and just take a mason jar, unscrew the lid, uh, scream as loud as you can into it, seal it back up, uh, and bury it under a park bench somewhere. Um, but yeah. God, you even included Gran Turismo, a movie everybody's forgotten about. <laughs> well, someone it's someone's favorite movie. So. 80 for Brady you included here. You're doing wow. the work. You're doing the work that people need to be doing. They're all on here. Well, not all of them. Some 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 got cut. But um, download it, make your own. Let Priscilla us know what your favorite movie is. For me. Oh, I loved Priscilla. I have to watch that. It's on it's on Max now. I got to catch up with that. I love Sophia. How is I Max? I love Sophia. Poor one. Round of applause for Sophia. Yeah. 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 Why not for Gia? Gia Coppola? Anyone? Palo Alto? No? Okay, yeah. Why not for Gia? What about Roman Coppola? He co-wrote fucking Moonrise Kingdom. Come on. All right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And a frequent collaborator with Wes Anderson. Yeah, yeah. What about about Bobby Coppola? Bobby Coppola, everybody. What about Noah Baumbach, the real author of Barbie? Am I right? (laughs) Hey, Marriage Stories, one of my top five favorite movies ever. Yeah, he's so good. good. Noah Baumbach kind of underrated. I like how we didn't clap wow. for Francis Ford Coppola. Who? Are we done? Yeah. That's been the Oscars episode. I was glad to see all of you and talk about this year's Oscars. Um, I saw a tweet that was like, it, maybe people, a lot of people are talking about this, how this Oscar season felt like it lasted all year. Um. And I'm glad it's over. I'm glad that uh, what comes out this year. I'm glad I'll finally get to see Ants 2. Sorry? <laughs> Slated for release July 2024. I'm looking forward to the challengers. Mm-hmm. Yeah, totally. Thanks for coming, guys.
Um, Thank you. Thanks this for was, having me. Thanks. Of course. This was a this was a great time. Uh, thank you so much. We'll see you probably again next year. No, I'm just kidding. Till next year, so folks. That Til has next been, year. That Bye, guys. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you. So if you're ever on a train with a guy you admire who you want to become friends with, yeah. um, maybe you're in a place where you two don't quite belong. Just so just pull a little handkerchief out of your pocket. Unfold, unfold those flaps and reveal a little doggy on the inside. A hot doggy. Classic mustard ketchup. And say, Booby, eat. <laughs> and that's all. That was beautiful. And he'll My take that and yet. you'll be friends forever and you'll make a bomb together, I guess. <laughs> it's beautiful, man. <laughs> Till next time. Till next time. Is it where Robbie actually made the microwave? Did you know that? No. Cool. Anyway, bye, guys. <laughs> One, two, three, four. These boys only want the best of. They want the cream of the crop. They don't want none of that Michael shit. They want the shit that bops. Oscar bait, black and white. Maybe something French. Uh-huh. If it's got more than one explosion, honey, put that shit on the bench. Oscar wieners. Oscar wieners. Oscar Wieners, these boys are the Oscar Wieners. Oscar Wieners. Quick question, does my audio sound okay? Yeah. Okay, because I... (laughs) Your audio cut out. (laughs) Wait, is it better now? That was incredible. Yes. yes. That was- <laughs>